Marianne. The oh, white rabbit God. drives the sh- every. Oh, my oh God, him saying Marianne is is like that's my hell. It's my hell. If you want to like psychologically torture me, just put that on me in a room like with that on a loop, and I will crack. <laughs> The horn. Oh God. Oh God. Oh God. Hello, and welcome to Poor Unfortunate Podcast. I'm Connor Perkins. And I'm Caroline A. Meddy. Welcome back to all of our returning listeners. It's so great having you back here with us. And welcome to any new listeners. Thank you for hitting play. If you like what you hear, please remember to hit follow or subscribe wherever you're listening to the podcast. That way all of our episodes download to your device and you don't miss out on anything. And at the end of the episode, hit five stars and leave a written review wherever you're listening to the podcast. It could be Apple Podcasts, Facebook, Spotify, Good Pods, wherever. Those reviews do a lot for us. Really helps us reach new people, be seen in search results, all that good stuff. So thank you very much for that. Now, Caroline, what's new? Well, I hate to share this bit of news because I don't think this will be accessible to our listeners by the time this episode airs, but I woke up this morning to a text from Connor in all caps that said, watch this now before it gets taken down. And it was a leaked live action Little Mermaid trailer. It was very poor quality, but it did the job, baby. (laughs) And I have to say, I got it because Ryan, one of our listeners, yes, texted Ryan. me and yes, was like, Ryan. Connor, have you seen this? And Ryan I was like, Ryan has kind Hold of on. been our live action Little Mermaid source. And, and I love yes. that for all three of us. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but it's even from this like trailer that stopped and started that I could barely see, I this might become my entire personality. I'm just warning everybody right now. Yeah, it's it's dark. Melissa it's, McCarthy's voice uh, sounds so good as Ursula. Incredible. Javier Bardem oh sounds like so menacing as King Triton, oh. which I love. Like I am. We oh get my the God. hair flip, the oh. iconic aerial hair flip. Oh, Hallie oh does God. it. It's set up the same way. Rob Marshall is back. Everybody, he is oh. here for his redemption arc from yes. Into the Woods. Yes. We are here for this. Oh my it's God. It's going to be so good. It can't come soon enough. I'm so excited. And speaking of that, um, there was a casting call released for actresses to um, be friends with the live action Ariel in the Disney parks. Yeah. Which is such huge news. We're looking for black Ariels. Hell fucking yeah. Yes. 2023, we're off to a good start. Yes. And I was wondering, I was like, you know, and this kind of ties into some other news. I was like, is she going to be in the grotto? Because the other news is that actually starting today when we're recording this, January 22nd, Ariel's Grotto in the Magic Kingdom and Disney World has now officially reopened. So you can go and meet Ariel. And they've announced that Enchanted Tales with yes. Belle will also be returning. Yeah, They don't have a date for that yet, right? They do. February 19th. It's coming up. I'm just going to miss it. I actually would go back to that. I'm kind of sad. Like, it was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed it. It was a lot of fun. That was one where, like, the pre-show is one of the, like, most the trippy things ever. And it's also just such a good experience with the princess. It's not just a meet and greet. It's, like, you get to experience. And that's one of the things I've really liked about the pandemic are those little, like, experiential moments that they have been setting mm-hmm. up with characters like Pooh with the butterfly Ned. And when yes. I was there, I saw Rapunzel... Yeah, so many like free floating characters. I love that. And while this isn't a free floating version of Belle, but it's something more than just stand in line, take your picture with the princess, and leave. It's an experience with her. And it's so good. And I'm so glad that it's coming back. Okay. Well, also on the note of kind of what we were talking about a bit last time in terms of, you know, folks who run the Disney parks listening to what the guests have to say, um, there have been some very subtle decor changes to Carousel Coffee at the boardwalk because so many people yes, complain. <laughs> <laughs> it's not that much of an improvement, but it's something. And the same thing goes with 
Apparently, a lot of people were complaining about the outside of Space Mountain being dirty, so they're cleaning yeah. it. And that's and great, but I'm like, why weren't we just, like, cleaning and repainting it anyway? <laughs> like, yeah. what? Why are we letting it get dirty and, like, moldy? <laughs> I don't understand. But they're I listening. I think they've just been waiting until the last possible second to do literally yeah. anything. Yeah. See how far it can go. Yeah, yeah. Other news that I heard about is that the star cruiser voyages, oh. a lot of them are being canceled. They're yeah. super low capacity and they're just canceling them. I what the what is going to be the future of the star cruiser? See, I just I don't, don't think know, it's gonna be sustainable. I saw I saw this person and, and I I feel so bad. I, I did not remember exactly what the tweet said or who the who the person was. But they said something to the effect of, like, I am exactly who you want for the Star Cruiser. Mm-hmm. I'm a huge, huge fan of Star Wars. But if I'm going to spend $3,500 for one person on two nights, I need to know that my storyline that I'm going to get isn't being someone who is going around Galaxy's Edge taking photographs of, like, cartons to help some musician <laughs> you know, do a good concert while somebody else is saving the galaxy. Mm -hmm. Like that's the thing is you don't know what your Uh, storyline is going to be. And it's like, and I don't, I mean, they're all for breaking things up, but I'm like, I guess you could do tiered pricing based on the story that you get. (laughs) Honestly, because they love tears. If I got a crappy storyline, but I could afford to go, I'd probably go. Yeah. I'd be like, yeah, if it's, if it's like a, a slightly more than average hotel stay and I get like a one of those the subplots like sure that's <laughs> like fine. I'm sweeping the star cruiser it's all right it's fine yeah <laughs> but if I pay thirty five hundred dollars for the star cruiser I want to make sure that like yeah. I am up there I'm communicating right. with Ray I'm Absolutely. communicating with the resistance like yeah. that is what I want to be doing definitely or joining the the first order like one of the two yeah yeah I never thought about that part of it before yeah because you don't know what you're gonna get <laughs> <laughs> Which is exhilarating, but also that's so much money to just oh possibly my God. light on fire. Absolutely not. No, I'm not going to light $3,500 on fire <laughs> to sleep in a bunk bed. <laughs> <laughs> well, also speaking of things being on fire, <laughs> Disney Twitter is on fire right now. Um, between people arguing over the closing of Splash Mountain and the addition of new parking lot signs in Epcot, it's just a very unpleasant place to be i mean i'm basically never there i'm there i like looked at it really quickly today and i was like and that's that's why i'm never there it's awful like, it's so toxic damn, folks damn just calm down it's gonna be okay it's at the end of the day from two people park. yeah like two people who have dedicated so much of their lives to talking about <laughs> disney y'all it's, it's yeah. a theme park okay like, it's a theme it's gonna park be okay we're we have opinions and everything but <laughs> at the end of the day there's going to be things that we like and there's going to be things that we don't like. Mm-hmm. But honestly, the the parking lot change, I think, is going to be really good. It's it going to be a lot easier for people sense. to remember. Yeah. Because they've divided it by space and Earth. So you've got mm-hmm. like Nemo and Dory and Moana and Hey Hey. And then on the space side, you've got Wally, Eve, Gamora and Rocket. And it's easy to remember space, Earth, spaceship, Earth, Epcot. Mm-hmm. Y'all, we can't, we cannot go this hard on every freaking no, change that they make. We cannot. Some of them, we can't. we've got to just let it happen and just yeah. say, okay, damn. But one of the other cool things is the Wally and Eve parking lot. Currently, Wally and Eve don't exist in the park, mm-hmm. but they have made the announcement that the Wonders of Life Pavilion that has been closed down forever and was like a conference center that was previously announced that was going to be like the play pavilion where it was interactive and stuff like that. They have now scrapped the idea of moving forward with that as the play pavilion and it will be something else. And so people are very hopeful that maybe with the announcement of Wally and Eve as characters for the parking lot, that something Wally focused will be going into that pavilion or maybe something will be happening to mission space. <laughs> There's so many people who are like mission space. Your <laughs> days are numbered. So I'm I'm excited. I would love to have Wally and Eve in the park. I think it would be great, especially in the direction that they're going. You know, Epcot has always been a place where it's an amalgamation of different IP, both mm-hmm. Disney and original and non IP yeah. stuff. Like it's always kind of been that. So and having Wally and Eve there, if if it's an opportunity for us to get the Wally that rolls around outside D23 oh my in gosh, the parks, please. I would love to meet Wally. So I would too. I'm okay with that. I would too. Didn't they? Am I making this up? 
Isn't there possibly going to be um, a revival of the ability to meet Figment? That's happening, oh, that's, right? Yeah, yep. The There is currently a sort of imagination station right now, and that's where oh, the Figment popcorn buckets are. Right. And that is where you will meet Figment. And they also have some of the old uh, things from the Imagination Pavilion <gasps> that used to be in, like, the imagination station area yeah. that's going to be – that's there. But that area is already open where you can go <gasps> in and you can – I don't think you can meet Figment just yet. Oh, but okay. that's where they're selling all the Figment popcorn buckets from. Oh, goodness. Well, speaking of that, yeah, it's Festival of the Arts um, through February 20th. So I'm going to be in Disney for a day. It's the first time I'll be there during Festival of the Arts. So I'm excited to catch oh, a yeah. little tiny bit of that. And also, just side note – I'll be in Disney for one day, and Connor crafted me this <laughs> uh, this itinerary. I've I, I've never seen anything like it, y'all. I'll have to tell you about it afterwards. It's pretty Fingers crossed it works. incredible. It's gonna work. It's gonna work. I can feel it. So I can't wait to tell everybody about that once once I get back from that. <laughs> and then in Disney Plus news, uh, the biggest thing that we've got on Disney Plus is that we got the teaser trailer for the third season of The Mandalorian. Uh, and it's coming out on March 1st. So oh. that's going to be pretty exciting there. And oh, the other big thing that happened that I didn't mention is the Golden Globes happened. And Angela Bassett won a Golden Globe for Best Supporting Actress in a, in a <gasps> drama, which oh, makes right. her the first wow. award that has gone to a Marvel movie for acting. And wow. of course, it's Angela Bassett for Black Panther. Oh, forever. wow. Yeah, I called that. <gasps> I sat amazing. there in the movie theater and like first scene I saw her and I'm like, she's going to get a freaking nomination for this. And she wow. won. And she friggin won. She did. Oh, congratulations. But that's that's kind of like all the news. We did a lot of news last time. So we did we're not so gonna... much news last episode. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that's that's the news that we've got. Now we're going to get into the episode. So this is the beginning of our next cycle. So we are back to a rant and rave episode for you. This episode, we have decided to get a little bit spicy to start out the year. With it's some, been a little while. We haven't yeah. been super spicy in a while. Yeah. Yeah. So we've got some some hot takes. And these are on Disney icons or... Disney characters that are not icons that we think should be. So mm -hmm. Caroline has the rant. She's going to talk about a Disney icon that should not be a Disney icon. And I have a rave. So I'm going to talk about a Disney character that isn't really seen as an icon, but deserves to be. So mm. Caroline, let's take it away with your rant. All right. <laughs> Here we go. I'm so I... excited for this one. <laughs> this is another... this has been a long time coming. This is something I've been holding inside. It's true. Yeah. So uh, here we go. My rant is titled, um, Alice, not a heroine, but a thought experiment manipulated by men. Ah! <laughs> so let's just start. I, I just want to get on the same page. Like, So everyone knows the page that I'm on when it comes to the term icon being iconic. So iconic is widely known and acknowledged, especially for distinctive excellence. It describes something or someone that is considered symbolic of something else. And an icon is a person or thing widely admired, especially for having great influence or significance in a particular sphere. So outside of characters in the Disney princess canon, Alice is one of the most merchandised and parks featured Disney heroines, perhaps notwithstanding Tinkerbell. Her attraction itself has even become an icon of Disney parks. But does Alice belong in a pantheon of icons that includes Mickey, who, Ariel, Woody, the genie, Elsa, and more? I say no way. No way. Both in the books and in this film, one of Alice's main struggles is with her personal identity. She feels as though she doesn't really know who she is, especially after all of the changes brought upon her in Wonderland. Granted, this is a big disclaimer for the whole thing. She's a very young character. She's a young girl. And this is a pretty common and understandable struggle for someone her age, which in this, like in the book, she's a little bit younger in this. Me and Connor were talking about it. She's like, what, 11 years old? 11. We'll say. I, I think she's there. like 11. She's 12. But also, okay. like, I'm the same person who went in on Peter Pan. So, like, yeah. <laughs> I was okay. like, Peter Pan is emotionally Great. manipulative and Great. abusive and everything. And he's <laughs> true, a child. So true. pop off, babe. Pop All off. All right. Thank you very much. So this film in particular does not bring Alice to any kind of conclusion or deeper understanding of who she is. The film is more of a reflection, a thought experiment. 
fine enough, I suppose, especially since this film was very much breaking the classic Disney fairy tale mold, and the source material, of course, was extremely nonlinear itself. But the fact that this kind of thought exercise just happens to star Alice should not earn her the status she currently holds as an iconic Disney character, one featured in parades, merchandise, attractions. She fits neither of the definitions that I just shared above, and we are going to dive into how. But first, of course, as we always do, some background information. Woo! Background information! (laughs) So Alice in Wonderland was released in the U.S. on September 14th, 1951. The directors are Clyde Geronimi, Wilfred Jackson, and Hamilton Lusk, who, of course, we've heard their names here before. They all had their hands in other classics of the era like Peter Pan, Cinderella, and Lady and the Tramp. Story. We had 13 people working on this story. All men, naturally. And the story is, of course, based on Alice's Adventures in Wonderland and Through the Looking Glass by Lewis Carroll. The producer is none other than Walt Disney himself, and the movie stars, among others, Catherine Beaumont as Alice, Sterling Holloway as the Cheshire Cat, Verna Felton as the Queen of Hearts, and Ed Wynn as the Mad Hatter. So the budget for the film was $3 million, very modest, but the box office in the 1951 domestic release fell short. It was $2.4 million. But Ooh. upon re-release in 1974, it earned $3.5 million in domestic box office and then has had another re-release and it's, it's made its money back. Just it took a long time. Yeah. Uh, this film contains 16 songs. It doesn't seem like it because some of them are featured for only like a quick moment. Written largely by Sammy Fain and Bob Hilliard with others by Oliver Wallace and Ted Sears and much more. And there were so many that were written for the film and got cut. We got a lot of mishmash going on. And got put into Peter Pan, baby. Yes, yes. So in terms of the reception, so right now the film has a 78% audience score on Rotten Tomatoes with an average critic rating of 6.8 out of 10, which is, if you think about it, nearly a failing grade, but whatever. (laughs) It was nominated for one Academy Award for Best Scoring of a Musical Picture. And I pulled this plot synopsis from Rotten Tomatoes because... I really couldn't be bothered with anything else, and I will explain why. (laughs) So, when Alice, a restless young British girl, falls down a rabbit hole, she enters a magical world. There she encounters an odd assortment of characters, including the grinning Cheshire Cat and the goofy Mad Hatter. When Alice ends up in the court of the tyrannical Queen of Hearts, she must stay on the ruler's good side or risk losing her head. So let me just start by acknowledging my bias. Oh, gee. I truly despise Alice in Wonderland. (laughs) really do. I find nothing fun, redeeming, or charming about this film, and watching it is true torture for me. (laughs) Even that Rotten Tomatoes description is just way too epic sounding for the sad excuse for an arc in this film. I also fully acknowledge that Wonderland is meant to be nonsensical and nonlinear. It's, I guess part of it is just, it's just not my thing and that's okay. But also, the thrust of Alice's emotional journey should be the thing that we can latch onto and track as she travels through Wonderland and there just isn't anything to hold on to here. But I will not be sidetracked by my issues with the film. Let's talk about Alice, what we know about her, how she faces her trials in Wonderland, and her place in both literary and cinematic iconography. So let's start with some characteristics. So Disney icons, to me, this is a generalization, but I think it kind of checks out. We love generalizations here. Yeah, great. (laughs) They're usually defined by one or several of the following characteristics. Bravery, kindness, and intelligence. I am here to argue that, sorry, Alice does not really possess any of these three. Ah! Let's start with kindness. As a younger Disney character, this trait should arguably be the most accessible to Alice. Children start school, and one of the first things they are taught is to treat people with kindness. Alice, on the other hand, exhibits an awful lot of impatience and outright anger for such a young person, who is, from what I can gather, pretty privileged in her life. First of all, Alice opens the film manifesting a world like Wonderland as she sings A World of My Own, down to magical flowers, rabbits who wear clothing and live in houses, and new birds that she's never even seen. Yes, the real Wonderland does not possess much of the pleasantness that her song seems to describe, but it's pretty telling to me that Alice's go-to reaction is annoyance and anger when she arrives in the place that she wished existed. (laughs) The first thing that she hears from the doorknob is that nothing is impossible. 
and her reaction is to raise her eyebrow in annoyance. Ah. Uh, isn't this the kind of world she was looking for, where anything can happen? I mean, a girl really gives new meaning to we're all mad here, okay? She also, like, she just is generally pissed at basically everything that she created. Yeah, exactly. She's like so, an evil god. Yes, to my next point, Alice argues with the majority of the inhabitants of Wonderland. For example, the flowers. After they have determined she must be a weed and they want her Not out wrong. of their flower bed immediately, they they rather rudely shoo her away. I can they, They're rude, all right? But when Alice senses that anger from them and her that rudeness, her first choice is to bully and one-up them, saying, if I were my right size, I could pick every one of you if I wanted to, and I guess that'll teach you. Like, <laughs> damn. To me... <laughs> death threats, basically. Yeah, it's a death threat. To me... This is not in any way, shape, or form a Disney character who should be widely admired, as the definition of an icon suggests. I don't see much of a point of going on an adventure with this grouch ball, okay? So, also, I just, side note, talking about the flowers, it was hilarious to me that Alice is a really terrible singer. It oh my almost gosh. feels like Disney it's is trying to make me hate her, okay? She it's, can't Oh, my sing. God. Just her voice, cra- and I'm just like, she's starting way too high. It's awful. Oh, God, no! It's nightmarish. Oh, it's so good. Uh, Genius. Then later, the Momraths point Alice to a path right when she's about to be at her lowest point. And rather than thanking them, she just scurries off, claiming that she just knew that she would find a path sooner or later. So she picks on everybody else for having no manners, and she absolutely has none either. So hypocrite also. (laughs) It's almost satisfying to me to watch Alice be faced with the almost as quick to anger Queen of Hearts. Um, I'm not a huge fan of the Queen of Hearts as a villain per se, but I also don't think it's a good sign that I want a Disney heroine to get her ass beat a little bit. I can enjoy a villain's villainry while still getting excited for the hero to best them, a la Hades and Hercules, for example. But more on that when we cover bravery. And just in general, Alice has an air of snobbery. We see a lot of turning up her nose, stomping away, refusing to listen, whether it's to the inhabitants of Wonderland or even to her own sister at the beginning of the movie. She does a lot of sulking. She's a snit. Not iconic behavior, especially when she doesn't change or at least have an air of mischief or sweetness to offset some of these more childish tantrums. It's just simply no fun to watch Alice discover this new world because of that. And I think it's the heart of why I find this movie so irritating. Next up. Caroline, I am living right now. (laughs) Living. So next up, intelligence. Since Alice is young, I'll look at this through the lens of smarts and common sense that an around 11-year-old should have. So one of Alice's first comments in the film is the very Gaston-esque insistence that she only wants to read books with pictures, no words. Is this something that young children would say when they're bored? Okay, sure. But this is a character who has become an icon. This laziness and lack of imagination is not a very good start. We often think of Alice in the general Alice in Wonderland tale as just, you know, falling down the rabbit hole to reach Wonderland. But let's not forget that this all happened because Alice saw the white rabbit and decides that she is going to go wherever he goes. Not only are children taught not to wander off on their own and to be careful around strangers, but Alice lets her curiosity not just take her through the park that she's in, but through a rabbit hole that she can barely squeeze into. So even if the rabbit hole didn't lead to Wonderland, uh, we now have a small child stuck in a dirt hole that could collapse into itself and suffocate her at any moment. Not smart. Granted, we've had lots of Disney heroes get themselves into situations that are perilous and not the most wise, but those are always in pursuit of something quite noble. Ariel makes a deal with a sea witch for love. Hercules jumps into the into like the ghost pit of the underworld to save Meg. Snow White runs into the forest to escape certain death. Alice wants to know where a rabbit is going. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Shit. Then we have the issue of consuming items that change her size. I mean, right off the bat, there is no way a child doesn't know not to eat or drink things offered to you by strangers, especially after falling down a bizarre rabbit hole and that stranger is a literal doorknob who's speaking to you. Best of all, Alice is aware that this is a super dangerous scenario, so there's no excuse of childish, innocent trust here. 
Upon being offered the drink me bottle, she says, better look first, for if one drinks much from a bottle marked poison, it's almost certain to disagree with one sooner or later. So is she pretty much confirming that this drink could very well kill her or make her sick, but only if she has a lot of it? Help and then me she chugs someone. It. <laughs> Help me somebody. In that case, fine. Even if we're going to look past taking consumables from strangers, <laughs> I can give Alice some credit in that it does take her some experimenting to figure out what the drinks and cookies do to her. And I won't fault her for trying to figure that out. But later at the White Rabbit's house, she sees those very same eat me cookies and absentmindedly nibbles on one as if it's just a yummy snack, when of course it balloons her to the size of the house. Lots of heroines of Alice's type, which we will get to, are much better at gathering whatever clues and rules that they can about the new world they've entered, while Alice makes absolutely no such effort. On a related note, <laughs> oh my god. This is on so a related good. note, as maddening as I can agree the inhabitants of Wonderland are, many of them drop Alice clues, often in the form of stories and songs, which is exactly the form lessons for young children often take, and Alice doesn't pick up on any of their messages. Tweedledee and Tweedledum share with Alice the story of the curious oysters. With curious in the title, Alice, who is aware of her curious tendencies, could pretty easily connect the story to her. The curious characters in the story are tricked and murdered. <laughs> uh, yeah, this might be a major warning to you, but no. Tweedledee and Tweedledum then literally tell Alice, uh, there's a good moral to this story. And she says, oh yes, a very good moral. If you happen to be an oyster. Yeah. <laughs> That's the sound of a red alert going right over her head. Same with the caterpillar's poem about a crocodile attracting fish with a smile. Then we have the flowers. Let's go back to the flowers. They sing all in the golden afternoon to and with Alice, unfortunately. <laughs> Their message may be a bit harder to discern here. So for me, the golden afternoon in a flower field that they are singing about means that Alice should get the hell out of Wonderland and get back to the flower field in the park back in the real world. That the simple joys in life are the most important. But interpretation aside, Alice joins in at the end of the song agreeing that, quote, you can learn a lot of things from the flowers. But what is it that she learns? The song does not make her see the beauty of her real home in the real world, and she ends up picking a fight with the flowers soon thereafter and hypocritically says that they could learn a few things about manners when she was just as rude. The definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. Rather than picking up on the riddle-fueled and ridiculous nature of the inhabitants of Wonderland, she expects to be able to ask them direct questions and receive direct answers, and she does so with little to no patience. If she listened more carefully and less literally, it would be easier to root for her as we see her do her best to adapt, which is very admirable and satisfying to watch, a la seeing Ariel make her way through the human world with new legs and no voice. Next, I am going to look at bravery, a little more like determination. After all, Alice is a young child thrust into a pretty terrifying and nonsensical world. Like, I can own that I would be crapping myself the entire time. But let's remember that Alice manifested and willingly entered into this world. But once she is in it, she shows a lack of conviction and ability to adapt to the rules of Wonderland. Most importantly, Alice entered Wonderland because she wanted to know where the white rabbit was going. That's it. She then abandons this extremely simple motivation as soon as Wonderland becomes too frustrating for her, saying, that rabbit, who cares where he's going anyway? Girl, did you really just bring us here for nothing? <coughs> if Alice's defining characteristic is going to be curiosity, and it's so easily abandoned in the face of frustration— I do not believe that she is the paragon of curiosity. I'd give that to Ariel, Rapunzel, or even Belle. Alice's bravery is also conditional on her size. She threatens the flowers with her size, and she only stands up to the Queen of Hearts when she grows to the size of the courtroom. Some of the most magical Disney moments happen when the little guy fights the system, a la Bernard and Bianca, Judy Hopps, or Snow White combating suffering with kindness. Alice's face-off with the big bad, the Queen of Hearts, isn't really much of one at all. 
It just ends with her pretty much making a run for it. Yeah. After using no ingenuity, sense, or bravery to get what she wants out of the queen. She just gets woken up by her sister in the end. It's like, pathetic. <laughs> like, she doesn't do anything. So now that we've talked about these three characteristics, here's my other issue with Alice as an icon. Alice doesn't learn anything. One redeeming thing about her, I will say, is that she is very aware that her curiosity can lead her to trouble points for a young kid knowing this and totally okay with me that she has a flaw, but it's never resolved and she never learns anything further about her own curiosity throughout the course of the film. And we get so close. After the one path that Alice finds has been swept away, she is at her most defeated. On the verge of tears, she says, if I'd listened earlier, I wouldn't be here, but that's just the trouble with me. I give myself very good advice, but I very seldom follow it. Aha! That sounds like the beginning of a lesson being learned. It also leads into this very contemplative moment that we've been needing from Alice. She sings about the way that being patient is very good advice, but also talks about the way waiting makes her feel curious. It's very endearing, and it's a very innocent and childlike reflection. And damn it, I was like, I'm starting to feel for this girl. Seeing her forlorn and crying is actually really damn sad. And she really recognizes the fact that not stopping to think while driven by her curiosity has real consequences. We get this very Disney princess-esque moment as the creatures of Wonderland look on sadly and they cry along with Alice. And it's this moment for me where the film actually locks in emotionally, which for me feels like what the Disney take on Lewis Carroll's twisted story should be. Will I ever learn to do the things I should, she asks. So it seems like the lesson that Alice has to learn is that maybe her advice to herself is lacking and maybe she doesn't always know the best choices to make, so she shouldn't let her curiosity run the show. To me, I mean, not the most interesting lesson for a Disney heroine, but it's fine. Then the Cheshire Cat appears to lead Alice to the Queen, and honestly, I am with Alice when she believes that the Queen will be able to help her find her way home. But once Alice is met with the, albeit very unbearable, Queen of Hearts, she does not act any differently than she has with the other creatures of Wonderland, that being a first instinct of submissiveness followed by anger and frustration when the new acquaintance proves themselves to be just as confusing and unpredictable as all the rest. And the conclusion of the film may be the most unsatisfying part of all for me. There's no achievement, No act of bravery or realization of Alice's that leads her on the path out of Wonderland and back to the door to the real world. It's all absolute chaos until she awakens from her dream, pretty much awakened by her sister, at which point we get exactly no reflection from her on her time in Wonderland. Not even a... She just walks away. Wow, I just had the strangest (laughs) dream. Nothing. She starts talking about the caterpillar. Her sister tells her it's time for tea and the movie ends. And she's like, all right. (laughs) And if you're me, you're just left thinking, how do I get my hour and 20 minutes back? Because I actually leave feeling worse about Alice than I did when I started the film. And then here's the other question. What was I really feeling about her in the first place? Well, Alice isn't that well-defined anyway. We get a very quick intro to her when the film opens. She seems daydreamy, unwilling to pay attention to her lessons. She's looking for something more interesting, a world of her own. Throughout the course of the film, it's hard to define who Alice is outside of her reactions to the creatures of Wonderland. She's curious, as she tells us many times, and the main feature of her character is an inability to know herself. She says in many different ways that she doesn't know herself or how to be herself because she's changed so many times in Wonderland. But I'm also not convinced that she knew herself before. And while this is actually a pretty interesting idea to play with, it does not a Disney icon make. If we go back to the definition of iconic, it describes something or someone that is considered symbolic of something else. So someone iconic should be symbolic and easily defined, as I think most Disney icons are. I also think the three-word Disney princess test is a pretty good gauge of this. Mm -hmm. What would Alice's three words be? Besides curious, I really don't have much. Annoying. Annoying. (laughs) Mean. Whiny. <laughs> Adventurous doesn't feel like a fit either, given how easily she is willing to give up on her one simple mission in Wonderland. Like a dreamer? We have those already. 
And Alice's dreams also don't feel inspiring or specific. She hates her dreams. <laughs> she, she hates, hates her them. dreams. <laughs> it would help so much if her dream of a world of her own was even, you know, like, oh, a place where everything is silly and not so serious. It would just at least provide more insight into who she is. She's silly. She's whimsical. But we have nothing. Or if she actually just enjoyed the world that she created. There's no <laughs> joy in what she's There's done. There's no joy. There's no joy. But, and that's different from the book. I feel like in the book, like, she does engage with I the world. I completely agree with and you. And is, like, enjoying it. Now, of course, the fact there's another factor in this and that there's so much discussion about the way that Lewis Carroll might have written the characters of the Alice stories to represent different mental illnesses. And many believe that Alice is meant to represent depersonalization disorder, DPD, characterized by a disordered and fragmented sense of self with symptoms including feelings of not belonging in one's own body, lack of ownership of thoughts and memories, and that movements are initiated without conscious intention, numbing of emotions, things like that. Oh, damn. And while this makes for an interesting literary character and an examination of the mind, this to me does not form the basis of a character who should be considered as iconic and common as she is in the Disney canon. Which makes me wonder why she is so popular in terms of merchandise and her features in the parks. The Alice you meet in the parks is often very polite and dainty, and while there are some aspects of this in the Alice from the film, that's not really an accurate representation of the gal that we meet in the film. <laughs> Can you imagine her just like bitch slapping a kid? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what she would do. Let's be real. She'd be mean. <laughs> Sometimes in the parks, she skips around with the Mad Hatter, who, let me remind you, pissed her off immensely in the <laughs> film. And outside of that, she's just pretty generic. I would actually love to talk to someone who has been friends with Alice in the parks to find out more about how Disney at large wants her to be portrayed because the basis just sure ain't there in the films. In her parks appearances, Alice fills more of the trope that I think everyone wants her to be, but she really isn't. Innocent, curious, and relatable. I think a lot of Alice's appeal is purely based in aesthetics. Her little cutie pie costume, pretty hair, her accent— and then the aesthetics of Wonderland itself. If you walk into Hot Topic, you'll see tons of Alice in Wonderland merch. But I believe that that has to do with what Wonderland stands for and looks like, rather than any attachment that folks have to Alice. And if we're talking aesthetics of Alice herself, I feel like Wendy pretty much gets the same job done as her. So we don't need Alice as an icon for the vibes either. I think folks are drawn to, you know, an innocent in a wonderland, that trope. And you know who does that a million times better? Dorothy and the Wizard of Oz. Mm -hmm. There have been many memes made about the similarities between Dorothy Gale and Alice. And it actually is believed that L. Frank Baum was indeed inspired by Alice in his creation of Dorothy down to her appearance. But wow, did he take a trope and improve it. <laughs> if we want to compare yeah. both heroines in their most widely known film versions— Dorothy fulfills all the same cliches as Alice, but is filled to the brim with way more heart. I mean, first of all, Dorothy's manifestation of Oz makes a lot of sense. She wants to go over the rainbow, to be free from a world that not only makes her feel trapped, but is filled with nasty people like Miss Gulch. There's a tangible thing that she's trying to escape from. Dorothy reacts with empathy to the creatures that she meets in Oz, no matter how odd or cruel. As soon as possible, she attempts to adapt to the rules of Oz, determining who she should listen to and how to reach her goal, which is to return home. Not to mention, <laughs> we get to see Dorothy's heart on display as she brings her beloved Toto on her adventure, while Alice just goes, see ya, Dinah, and Bye, leaves Dinah. the poor cat behind to just fend for herself in the real Though, world. <laughs> honestly, Dinah got the better end of that deal. <laughs> She's Definitely. like, oh, thank God, I get to be away from her for a while. Both gals wake from a dream back in their real lives. While Alice remains the same girl that we met at the film start, Dorothy reflects on the way her heart's desire can be found just in her own backyard, if only she's willing to see it. Her greater appreciation for her home and loved ones after being taken from them is something that we can all grasp onto and relate to our own lives. I won't go on and on about Dorothy. I know that she is not a replacement for Alice in the Disney canon, because she ain't Disney. But ultimately... I believe whatever defining characteristics we can glean from Alice can be found in many other more iconic characters, Disney and otherwise. 
Going back to the definition of iconic, Alice is certainly not symbolic of this era in Disney animation and is not a distinctively excellent example of a Disney title character, and she's nowhere near defined enough as her own person to be so. As for the definition of an icon, she should not be admired for having significance in the Disney sphere, not only because she displays far from admirable smarts and heart, but because of her lack of endearment to audiences when her film premiered. The box office of the original release of Alice in Wonderland was lackluster, and Disney took a loss on the film. In the book Walt Disney, The Triumph of an American Imagination, Neil Gabler notes that Walt himself said that the film lacked heart. Walt had toyed with and developed the idea of a film version of the Alice stories many times throughout his career, often with the plan for a combination of live action and animated elements, which he did accomplish in short form as a young man creating laughograms with a live action Alice in an animated world. He tinkered with this in a full length version many times, but it was concept drawings from Mary Blair that pushed him to move forward with a fully animated Alice story. So the impetus for the film was the design rather than the story or the main character. So for this same reason, Alice in Wonderland has become more appreciated over time, especially when the film's trippy look was adopted by college-age viewers as a symbol of 1970s drug culture, which is so funny to me. (laughs) The film is hailed as a classic now, but I firmly believe that it's for its design only. Mm -hmm. Animator Ward Kimball felt the film failed because, and I quote, it suffered from too many cooks, directors. Here was a case of five directors, each trying to top the other guy and make his sequence the biggest and craziest in the show. This had a self-canceling effect on the final product. And to me, here is the ultimate proof of the failure of the character of Alice. How on earth could an all-male team of writers and directors tell the story of a girl's questioning and at least partial discovery of self? If Alice comes off as a snit, as weak, as confused... Would that not be pretty representative of the way society was still stereotyping women, especially young women, in the 1950s? Let's let Alice as a Disney heroine go and consider her simply as an aspect or reflection of a fantastical world that piques our own curiosity rather than a beacon of curiosity and adventure itself. Female protagonists deserve so much better. Damn. (laughs) Oh my God, I have been waiting for this for a very long time. (sighs) Yeah, I feel like she and Merida have just kind of been sitting there waiting for me to come for them. (laughs) Yeah, and now you've you've gotten them both. Yeah. How does it feel? I I hate that I'm coming for women, (laughs) though. I I hate it, but it's like, I feel like I've come to the conclusion with both of them. It's not like their fault. It's a lot of the production just lets them down. Yeah, it's a lot of the men that tamper with shit and then absolutely ruin it. Absolutely. I fully yeah. am here for all of it. Alice, go back and if you are someone who is sitting here in this rant being like, but, but I, but I, but go back and watch this movie. Actually watch what Alice does. That's exactly right. Because that's what I'm saying is she's taken on this weird life of her own that is not a realistic reflection of who she is in the movie at all. And Peter not Pan the is exactly the same way. Yes, I agree with you. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Wow, that's interesting. That's interesting. Also, I want to know, I don't think I really know from you, how do you feel about that movie overall? Like, do, can you, like, get through that? I don't think you, oh, I know yeah. you I mean, hate it as I, much as me. I enjoy, I enjoy watching Alice in Wonderland, but it's mostly just for pretty much every other character but Alice. <laughs> I enjoy the design. The art is really what mm-hmm. brings me to it. Right. And I also enjoy the music of it. It's very, it's that nostalgia Disney yes. sound it's super that I evocative. really like, but it's not like a princess movie or something. So it's yeah. just like a adventure sort of thing of vignettes. So I feel like I... I don't have to invest all of my mm. emotion into it because I can just sort of like catch a piece and then I can text somebody or do something else. Yeah. And then, oh, I'll catch another piece. But if that's the thing, though, like if I am going to this movie because of my ability to emotionally detach from it <laughs> being convenient to me, that's not good. It just... aside from me not liking Alice, I don't like any of the other characters. The whole thing, and again, this is the part that's just completely personal to me. There's no basis in fact. It just gives me the major ick. Oh. Like, it makes me feel uneasy and terrible all the time. (laughs) 
but yeah, no, for me, what what brings me back is the, is the art of it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's not because it's it's a great story because it's not. Yeah, it's I, I mean it is a great story. Alice in Wonderland is the book a great, is great. I like the book a, great a lot. Story. I mean I think they chose all of the right scenes to do. Like if you're gonna adapt Alice yeah. in Wonderland, I yeah. think they chose all the right stuff. But it you can feel the disjointedness of it, mm-hmm. and you can feel the competition because you're yeah, absolutely you totally right. Can. The one upmanship because why is the unbirthday scene? going just as hard as the walrus and the carpenter. Mm-hmm. The world and the vibes just feel very male. They just they are. feel so male to me. And like, I think that's why it makes me feel uneasy. Except for the art. The art feels female to me. I feel Mary Blair in the art. Right. Yeah, it's a weird juxtaposition. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad that you did that rant. I think it was <laughs> definitely time. And... <laughs> I thoroughly I will come it for a male character next time. I'm done bashing the women. I'm done. Right. Great. <laughs> well, you, you have a good perspective on it, so. Okay. Thank you. All right. Well, I'm going to hop into my rave. And I, I just buckle in, folks, because Ooh. this has been a long time coming. Uh, yes, I, I've been waiting for this one for quite some time. Yeah, I'm just going to I'm just going to start in. I'm not even going to tell you I'm going to reveal it in a very dramatic way because I've basically written everything out. So here we go. <laughs> An icon, by definition, is a representative symbol worthy of veneration, something that we should look to or in the case of people or personalities, someone that has changed the fabric of the world significantly enough to be deemed noteworthy. So in thinking of Disney, we have a number of iconic characters from Mickey Mouse and Tinkerbell to Ariel and even Stitch. And there's one such character that I would elevate to icon status that is too often overlooked. A character that, in my view, exceeds many of the other Disney icons by being a symbol that we should aspire to be more like. And I think it is fitting that my first rave of 2023, the year of the rabbit, is about none other than one of the finest Disney heroes ever created, Judy Hopps. <gasps> Yes. So yes, folks, this is my Zootopia rave moment. It's happening. And as I usually do, I'm going to give you a little bit of background information about Zootopia. So Zootopia was released on March 4th, 2016. It was directed by Byron Howard and Rich Moore. The screenplay is by Jared Bush and Phil Johnston. And the story is by... Byron Howard, Rich Moore, Jared Bush, Jim Reardon, Josie Trinidad, Phil Johnston, and Jennifer Lee. That many people worked on this story. And we're so much better off for it. It was produced by Clark Spencer, and it stars, among others, Jennifer Goodwin as Judy Hopps, Jason Bateman as Nick Wilde, Idris Elba as Chief Bogo, Nate Torrance as Benjamin Clawhauser, J.K. Simmons as Mayor Lionheart, Jenny Slate as Assistant Mayor Bellwether, and Shakira as Gazelle. (laughs) What a cast. The budget for this movie was $150 million, and the box office raked in $1.025 billion worldwide. (gasps) I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. It has a 98% on Rotten Tomatoes with an average score of 8.1 out of 10. It won the Academy Award, Golden Globe, Critics' Choice Award, and Annie Award for Best Animated Film and was chosen by the AFI, the American Film Institute, as one of the top 10 films of 2016. Mm, Wow. (sighs) (laughs) <laughs> if you can tell, I am really excited to talk about this. No, you're so happy. So I'm going to give you a plot synopsis. I just took this from Wikipedia because I had so many other things to write about and I didn't yes, bother absolutely. writing this. So taking place in the titular city of Zootopia where anthropomorphic mammals coexist, it tells the story of an unlikely partnership between a rabbit police officer and a red fox con artist as they uncover a criminal conspiracy involving the disappearance of predators. I'm going to get into my rave now, but beware because spoilers are ahead. Mm. So if you have never watched Zootopia, it is a mystery. So I would say just really, for real, stop this right now until you can watch Zootopia and then finish my rave. Because I don't want to take that away from you if you haven't seen it. It's such a good movie. Uh, Clearly, I've just laid out all of its accolades. So (laughs) you should go watch this movie. All right. So now that you've gone and done that. 
I could go on at length about how this movie is an example of how Disney changed the game again in terms of the stories we can tell through this medium, what themes are possible to talk about in global family entertainment, and how we talk about them as well. But that's not this rave. Instead, I'm going to look at a new type of hero that came out of this movie and effectively gave us the blueprint for what a complex modern hero could look like. Mm. I'm going to boil all of that down to three main personality traits of Judy Hopps that are the roadmap for an iconic hero of today, how she demonstrates them, and why they are important in the first place. Mm. So the first character trait I'm going to dive into, Judy is dedicated slash determined. Mm. Dedication or determination is the quality of one's commitment to a purpose. You're sticking with something despite the difficulty of the situation you find yourself in because you have a deep connection to what it is that you are doing and why you're doing it in the first place. In a world of short attention spans and endless scrolling, the stick-to-itness of this quality I personally find to be quite lacking. In many ways, I see culturally a shift to prioritize comfort over growth, which can lead to abandoning something at the first sign of resistance. Mm, Now, I'm not saying that people don't deserve to be comfortable or should continue with things that are unsafe for them. But there's also a beauty in struggle when you are connected to a purpose or a reason behind something that you're trying to do. And those determined and dedicated people, they stand out. We learn very quickly that Judy Hopps is one of these dedicated and determined characters with her adoption of Gideon Gray's offhand comment about her, I don't know when to quit. Hmm. Cut to her training at the police academy as an adult rabbit and struggling to keep up with peers who might be predisposed to do well at many of the physical tasks of being a police officer in the animal kingdom. But Judy meets the resistance and doesn't give up. She is committed to her dream of making the world a better place as an officer and eventually succeeds. She graduates the police academy as valedictorian and the first officer of her species But her success isn't achieved because of someone else intervening or some sort of deus ex machina. It all comes from her own determination. She puts in the work and thinks creatively about how to use what is uniquely Judy to address the obstacles between her and her dream. And I think that is something that we can all remind ourselves of from time to time, that our dedication to a cause can reveal the best and most special parts about ourselves. Aww, yeah. Trait number two. Judy Hopps is optimistic. Optimism is your ability to see the best in the situation, to have hope and confidence in a positive outcome. Jumping back into our modern world for a second and why this is important, there is this nihilistic trap that is increasingly easy to fall into. It can almost be cool or trendy or of the moment to give in to the doom and gloom. With everything going wrong in the world, what's the point? Or worse, we take the little bit of light or good and squash it down in order to temper our expectations so the inevitable loss doesn't hit so hard. Oh my God, excuse me. Stop. (laughs) Right? (laughs) Sprinkle in the fact that many media outlets prey on fear factor in order to keep us constantly consuming news. And it makes for a pretty bleak view of the world. In 2013, in an interview with Oprah Winfrey, Dr. Brene Brown, who is this amazing (gasps) sociologist. Yes, bring in Brene. Okay. She said that joy is the most terrifying emotion that humans face. Mm. Because our fear of it being taken away. She says, quote, when we lose our tolerance for vulnerability, joy becomes foreboding. Mm. We try and dress rehearse tragedy so we can beat vulnerability to the punch, end quote. Oh, please. I'm just going to let that sit there for a second. But what is optimism, if not the ability to hope for joy? Judy Hopps actively practices optimism on herself, on others, and on the world around her. 
she sees a shitty parking duty assignment as an opportunity to exceed an expectation, writing 200 tickets by noon as opposed to 100 by the end of the day. Now, granted, she's writing parking tickets, and I'm not a fan (laughs) of parking tickets, but I love the optimism here. She reminds her parents before heading into Zootopia that Gideon Gray was just a jerk who happened to be a fox, not a jerk because he was a fox. She sees her small, worn-down apartment as a place that is allowing her to live out her dream. And when she's having a bad day working her parking duty assignment, she forces herself to hold on to some optimism for herself. She repeats, I am a real cop, I am a real cop, to remind herself that her worth is not dictated just by what she is doing. And the thing about optimism, Judy's included, is that it often can inspire others. Her hope for things to turn out right and way of looking for the best in people inspires her parents to begin partnering with Gideon Gray on their farm. It softens Chief Bogo's prejudice towards her, and it chips away at Nick Wilde's own jaded view of the world and of himself. In fact, Beginning with her first interaction with Nick in the ice cream parlor, she has to force herself out of her own initial bias towards foxes and actively practice optimism. I think it's important for us to see that it isn't just a given with Judy, but something that she works at. After assuming that Nick is the problem because he's a fox, she turns herself around and takes his side, having hope that he is a good person and everything's going to turn out right. And does she get hustled by him? Yes. Yes, she does. (laughs) But her optimism and good heart continually challenges him to the point that he starts to believe it too. He takes the application to the police academy and eventually becomes her partner by the end of the film. To quote another Jennifer Goodwin character, Snow White, on the ABC show Once Upon a Time, believing in even the possibility of a happy ending is a very powerful thing. And that... It's just optimism. You know I don't love Once Upon a Time, but I got a little baby chill. (laughs) Girl, I have thoughts. I have feelings. My third character trait, Judy is accountable slash evolving. Now, these words don't seem like they're related, but in my mind, they are. To be accountable is to take responsibility for the things that you say and the way that you act. And to evolve is to gradually change into a more complex form. And in my opinion... There is no evolution without first being accountable. It's about owning who you are, the good and the bad, in order to move forward. It's also a matter of knowing what you know and being open to what you don't know. Hmm. One of the most frustrating things to me personally is how rigid we have become in beliefs In the age of social media, we see fights breaking out in comment sections all the time. It's happening right now about Splash (laughs) Mountain. Twitter. Or people digging into the past of someone in order to find a gotcha moment. Or worst of all, rejecting truth outright. And along with all of that, we see blatant refusal to accept responsibility for words and actions and the consequences they have. It's modeled to us by celebrities, elected officials, neighbors, friends, family, strangers. The toxicity of interacting online becomes paralyzing to the point that we stop engaging at all, even in the real world. Mm. And that's when we stop evolving. We sit, more or less as we are, isolated on a collection of islands. Now, again, I want to be clear that there's a difference between what I'm talking about and choosing not to engage in conversation or certain activities, relationships, etc. for your safety. But I believe in engagement. And I'm a firmer believer in the statement that we should normalize changing your mind when presented with new information. Mm. We lose when we stop evolving, so we lose when we stop interacting. And in order to interact, we need to own our shit, take responsibility for what we say and do, know what we know, and know what we don't know, and be open to learning or that, God forbid, we might even change our mind. Judy Hopps owns her shit. In the example that I gave in the ice cream parlor, we see her owning her internal bias towards foxes from her past experiences. We watch her take a beat and check herself before changing her outlook on the situation and moving forward. And this is something that we need to normalize. We all have biases, 
And we all have different experiences that have made us into the people that we are today. But it is our responsibility to check them before we engage with each other. But back to Judy. We see her again holding herself to account for the damage that she has caused in the wake of her comments at the press conference when she resigns from the police force rather than take a promotion to be the face of the ZPD. She says that a good police officer should, quote, serve and protect, help the city, not tear it apart, end quote. She knows that her part in the recent events has fanned flames of fear and sown seeds of discord. Mm. It would be irresponsible for her to continue, let alone double down with a promotion. And in addition to holding herself accountable professionally and personally, she holds herself accountable to her friends. Her apology to Nick for the damage that her words caused their relationship are honest and meant. She says, quote, I was ignorant and irresponsible and small-minded, end quote, full stop. Mm. She is not apologizing with the intent to change his opinion of her, but rather to acknowledge his pain and the role that she played in it. This is what an actual apology should be, focused on healing hurt, not seeking forgiveness. And as a result of all of this accountability, Judy is able to move on to a more evolved place and a heightened level of understanding. She is able to embrace the messiness of the world, have a deeper connection to the work that she wants to do as a police officer, and bring her relationship with Nick to a deeper place. Now, all three of these personality traits on their own help define this modern hero that Judy is representative of and that we should aspire to be. But I think what I love most in this film is that Judy has taken a few dimensions further than just these three personality traits, and she's made into even more of a complex character with the way that these characteristics interact with one another. So let's look at how she uses them together. Oh, Determined optimism. Her commitment to having hope for a positive outcome, making optimism the purpose to which she is committed. We see this in her self-motivation and willingness to work on a case that has been dismissed and deemed unworkable. She even goes a step further and bets her entire career on her ability to solve this case. She is that committed to things working out for the best. And honestly, I think we should all bet on ourselves a bit more and trust our own ability to make things work out. Next thing, optimistic accountability. Believing that she can make something right and has the responsibility to do so. When Judy has the epiphany on her parents' farm at the end of the film that the night howlers are flowers, she does not hesitate to get in the truck and head back to the city to make it right. She could just as easily have called it in from the farm and let someone else handle it, but she knew that at the end of the day, she had the responsibility to fix a mess that she contributed to. And moreover, she believed wholeheartedly that she could solve the case to make things right. And then evolving dedication. This is both being able to change what it is that you are dedicated to and also being dedicated to change, especially the perceptions of others. The Judy at the beginning of the film that wants to, quote, make the world a better place is very different from the one at the end who says those same words. At the beginning of the film, she was dedicated to a more naive view of the world that glosses over the conflict and seeks harmony. But by the end, she has evolved this dedication to making the world better by realizing that differences need to be celebrated and the mess of it all embraced. In being dedicated to change, we see this in the way that Judy is determined to make a difference and be a better version of herself. Each moment she holds herself accountable, she is demonstrating her commitment to being better. Perhaps the best example being the open acknowledgement of having limitations and making mistakes in her speech at the police academy graduation. As for being committed to changing perceptions of others, we get introduced to that in the opening scene at the talent show, and it follows her through the entire story. She is constantly pushing people to see her outside of their preconceptions, from showing the police academy coach how she can excel at the obstacle course, to showing Nick that everyone isn't locked into stereotypes when she hustles him. Mm. Judy is constantly challenging everyone around her and herself to be better and open their minds. 
And to take it all one step further, we get to see all three of these characteristics working together. Judy's final speech is the fusion of her dedication, determination, her optimism, and her accountability slash evolution as she articulates a vision for the future. And I'm going to end this rave by just reading her final monologue and letting Mm. it stand for itself. So here it is. When I was a kid, I thought Zootopia was this perfect place where everyone got along and anyone could be anything. Turns out, real life is a little bit more complicated than a slogan on a bumper sticker. Real life is messy. We all have limitations. We all make mistakes, which means, hey, glass half full, we all have a lot in common. And the more we try to understand one another, the more exceptional each of us will be. But we have to try. So no matter what type of animal you are, from the biggest elephant to our first fox, I implore you, try. Try to make the world a better place. Look inside yourself and recognize that change starts with you. It starts with me. It starts with all of us. Ah. Judy Hopps is the complex modern hero we have been waiting for. She is multidimensional and flawed and current. She shows us a way to navigate our own messy and complicated world right now through acceptance and calling for us all to be better. Judy is the icon without the status. This dumb bunny is the character we should be putting forward as someone to look up to, to aspire to be. Judy Hopps is the symbol for a better future. Uh, oh. <sighs> How do you feel? There's my rave, baby. <laughs> First You've one been in holding 2023. You've that in your heart for so long. How do you feel? I really have. Oh, my God. No, I have been holding that in probably since the first moment I saw Zootopia. I fell in love love with this movie. I know. I know. The first Funko Pop I ever got was Judy Hopps. It was a gift. But yeah, I I just, I I look at Judy Hopps and I'm like, she should be at the forefront of a lot of people's minds more often than I think she Mm. is. Zootopia even as a film should be something that is more at our minds because it's also, it's a quite an easy film to watch. Like, I agree. It's some heavy hitting topics, but it's, it's really easy and enjoyable to watch. And I and I love an animal mystery. Like, I love the rescuers. <laughs> you really, I love the great mouse detective. Oh, my detective. God. That's your job. Lo- Wait. Oh, my God. Something just Animal mystery, into baby. Animal, animal mystery is animal your genre. Mystery. It's my shit. Oh, my God. But oh. Judy Hopps is my gal. I love Judy Hopps. I know. But I think the thing that I love most about her is that she's very flawed. And... Mm-hmm. It's not about her succeeding in spite of her flaws. In many ways, she succeeds as a character because of her flaws. Mm. Because she makes mistakes and owns them and makes them right. And I'm like, that's like, sure, there are other Disney characters that like fuck up, but their ending, their happy ending that they have is usually not necessarily related to the mistake that they made or truly yeah, about owning their mistake. Yeah. Her happy ending is is that we're going to keep making mistakes. Mm. And that's what, and it's in the, it's in the song. It's in try everything. I know. I'll keep on making these new mistakes. <sighs> like yeah, oh. because we're we're all going to be making mistakes because we're all trying to figure out how to live this in this world together. And there's no right way. There's no guidebook for any of this. But we just keep trying. We just yeah. keep trying to be better every single day. And you're right. She's very modern. She's a very modern. She's take extremely on modern. Some of these like Disney like principles. She's the modernized version of a lot of them. Yeah. Yeah. And which nuanced. is why. Yeah. She needs to be. She's the icon of the of the modern Disney character <sighs> for me. Oh yeah. And I hope she is for you. And if not, <laughs> I hope you'll give her a chance. <laughs> Alrighty, well, that's going to do it for us for this episode. Thank you all for joining us on this <laughs> wild first rant <laughs> rave of 2023. Uh, if you liked what you heard and are looking forward to more episodes like this, please remember to hit follow or subscribe wherever you're listening to the podcast so all of our episodes download to your device. You don't miss out on anything new. 
And be sure to hit five stars and leave a written review wherever you are able to. Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Good Pods, Facebook, anywhere that you're listening to your podcast. It does so much for us in terms of getting us out there, having other people see what you liked about this so that they hit play too. So please, just the extra little few seconds it takes to write something down, please do it. And if you have been listening for all of this time and still haven't done that, it would mean the world to us to start off 2023 with your review. So thank you for doing that. And if you haven't followed us on social media yet, please do. We are at Poor Unfortunate Podcast on Instagram and Facebook, and we are at Unfortunate Pod on Twitter. Uh, I remember after my Merida rant, we had some people agreeing. We had some people super mad at me, and I welcome it all. So if you love Alice, let me know why. I want to hear it. I, again, I want to be more like Judy Hopps, and I want to be able to hear some new information and maybe change my mind. So come over to social media and let us know what you thought of this episode. Uh, and if you want even more Poor Unfortunate podcast in your life, please join our private Facebook group, The Poor Unfortunate Fam. So that's where our listeners come and talk about the episodes, talk about their Disney trip, Disney news. And it's a great way for Connor and I just to get to know our listener base a little bit better, to hear what you want us to talk about. Honestly, Alice in Wonderland and Zootopia were two requested films. So we're listening. So come over there. Um, Get to know some other listeners better, and uh, we would love to see you. And if you're a fan of the podcast and need to show it to the rest of the world, the Poor Unfortunate Shop is open. You can go to poorunfortunatepodcast.com slash shop and see all of the merchandise that we have available. T-shirts, sweatshirts, drawstring bags, water bottles, stickers, the works. So go online, check that out, poorunfortunatepodcast.com slash shop. And as I always say, it does take us a little bit of money to keep the podcast up and running and coming to you. We do have a PayPal account, and it's linked in the episode description and in the website links on our social media accounts. Truly, anything that you have to spare goes a long way for us. You can make a one-time donation. It could be a monthly donation, $5, $10, more than that. It all just goes right back into the podcast, helping us keep it free and, for the most part, ad-free as well. So thank you very much. And to all of our donors, especially the ones who are donating monthly, thank you so, so much for your support. Thank you. Well, that's going to do it for us for the end of the episode thing imajig yep absolutely until next time i'm con- oh no we don't do that <laughs> until next time <laughs> i'm unhinged right now caroline <laughs> are we keeping this in i don't know <laughs> until next time beluga, beluga sabruga, sabruga.